Now I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, who many of you likely know, a man who bleeds blue and white more than anyone that I've ever met. Roger Williams is the former executive director of the Penn State Alumni Association. He also serves as an affiliate associate professor of higher education here at the university. Roger earned three Penn State degrees, a bachelor's in history, a master's in journalism, and a doctorate in higher education. From 2003 to 2015, he led our organization and was the Associate Vice President of Alumni Relations at Penn State. Prior to his service with the Alumni Association, Roger was the Associate Vice Chancellor for University Relations at the University of Arkansas. He was an Associate Vice President for Communications at Georgetown University as well. He is widely regarded as a scholar and expert on the land-grant mission in higher education and is the author of numerous journal articles and publications on this topic. He has authored two books, Evan Pugh's Penn State, America's Model Agricultural College, and The Origins of the Federal Support for Higher Education, George W. Atherton and the Land-Grant College Movement, both published by Penn State University Press. Roger was named the 2018 Distinguished Alumnus of the University, and he is one of only 53 people to be awarded the, Lion Paw, the Lion's Paw Medal for his service and contributions to Penn State. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our good friend, Roger Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Have fun. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate that and appreciate the great work you are doing to take the Alumni Association to the next level. Good morning, everyone. This is a great morning. This is the morning of a resounding victory over those Buckeyes, and we are going to do it. We are going to do it. Absolutely. Now, is this sound level loud enough for you all? You can hear? OK. Well, it's a thrill to be here and to talk to you a little bit about our origins as a university. And we're going to go back in time. We're going to go back to start about 190 years ago. Imagine that, almost two centuries ago. That's where this story begins with this gentleman, Evan Pugh. As you can see, he's a Pennsylvanian from Chester County. Our founding president from 1859 to 1864. He was here only four and a half years before his untimely death. But he, more than almost any other contemporary of his day, was a visionary in terms of what agricultural colleges, eventually land-grant colleges, needed to do and to be. So let's get into it. You know, Joe Paterno had his grand experiment, and you all are familiar with that. Evan Pugh had what he called, his words, his great experiment. He built the nation's first successful agricultural college, and he built it on the highest scientific standards of the day. He secured the land-grant designation for Penn State, and of course, that continues to define us to this day. But he was more than a local figure. He was a national figure, and he influenced the development of agricultural colleges across this country, as well as other practices designed to advance American agriculture. And he was the first to develop a visionary plan for what became the American land-grant college, as you will see. His background, he was born in 1828, 190 years ago, in the lower right-hand corner of the map, in Oxford, in the extreme southwest corner of Chester County. And what you see here is how his family's farm looks today. These buildings are not original to Evan Pugh's time. Those buildings are long gone. But it's still a farm in beautiful Chester County. And the stone you see is the threshold of the old Pew farmstead, the homestead. And the writing on that, which is hard to decipher on that plaque, uh, it was established by the Penn State Alumni Association, the Chester County chapter of the Alumni Association, and the university proper. Evan Pugh's youth. He is sixth generation Welsh Quaker. Now imagine that, his great-great-grandfather, Ellis Pugh, 
emigrated to Pennsylvania from Wales about 1685. That's only two or three years after William Penn established the holy experiment of the province of Pennsylvania. Pew's father, Lewis, was a blacksmith and farmer, as were all Pew males. That's what you did on the family farm. When Evan was two, his father had a terrible accident uh, in the blacksmith shop. It blinded him. He survived for about 10 more years, but it put a lot of pressure on the family. And Pew and his elder sister went to live at the house you see here. This is his grandfather's house, which is literally across the street, if you will. Evan didn't have a lot of friends growing up. It was a kind of isolated existence. He's reported to have been reflective, sort of melancholy, but very inquisitive, very intellectually curious, even at an early age. In 1844, he decided to follow the family tradition and apprentice as a blacksmith. He hated it. He called it an utter waste of time. It interfered with what he wanted to do, which was to get an education. So he left. He went to a manual labor academy in Whitestown, New York, near Utica, for a year. He returned to Chester County the following year, and he taught school across the state line, the Mason-Dixon line. Oxford is only about as the crow flies, maybe three, three miles north of the Mason-Dixon line. In 1849, he opened his own school, Jordan Bank Academy, on the family farm, very successful. He would have anywhere from 25 to 30 students, most of them residential students, and the school was centered on the sciences, which was very unusual for an academy in that era. Evan Pugh was also something of a writer. In fact, he was a voluminous writer. He was as comfortable with the written word as he was with scientific apparatus. No question about it. And he worked for the local newspaper. He did lots of reporting. And he continued that tradition when he left the United States and went to Germany. He would send lengthy dispatches back to the local newspaper and to the New York Herald Tribune and other papers as well. He was quite a writer. In 1852, Evan Pugh covered Pennsylvania's first women's rights convention, which was held in Westchester, in Chester County. And you can see some of his reportage here. He's saying the question of women's rights affects the whole human race. We know from sad experience that man cannot rise while woman is degraded. Of course, Evan Pugh, keep in mind, is a Quaker, and one of the tenets of Quakerism, of the Society of Friends, is egalitarianism and uh, equal gender rights. So he was what you might call an early feminist. Pugh came under the tutelage and under the influence of uh, one of the leading botanists in America during this time, a gentleman named William Darlington, Dr. Darlington, who lived in Westchester and who was a medical innovator. He was called the Nestor of American Botany because he was on a search for plants that contained curative properties that could be applied to address various maladies. And he encourages Evan Pugh to think about going abroad. Pugh is a very bright young boy. And Darlington is saying, you really deserve to go abroad and get an education. Advanced scientific study really didn't exist much in America before the Civil War. So those people who wanted advanced training needed to go abroad. And Germany, or the German states more accurately, was the mecca of scientific advancement in the uh, mid-19th century. So it's 1853, okay? Pew is 25 years old. He's had five years under his belt as being a very successful schoolmaster. And now he is getting on a sailing ship in New York Harbor, and he's crossing the Atlantic, and he has an agenda. He knows at this early age exactly what he wants to do. And what he wants to do, first of all, is to fit himself as a scientist so that he can go forth and create in America what he would consider to be the first agricultural college which he considers to be the linchpin of a whole system 
of agricultural advances that will produce good results for American agriculture. So he studies first at Leipzig University with some of the very best chemists on the face of the earth at the time. And he happens to meet this young man, Sam Johnson. Uh, Samuel Johnson is a Yale graduate. He just graduated and he, like Pew, is moving over to Europe to take advantage of what it has to offer. Johnson is not gonna stay in Germany that long. He's eventually, after about a year and a half, gonna go back to Yale where he uh, assumes a position on the faculty and long story short, he rises to become probably the leading figure in American agricultural science of his day. He long outlives Evan Pugh. But they form a very tight relationship and they become confidants one of the other. And with Johnson, Pugh could let his hair down, which he does. He writes about uh, legislative blockheads, if you will, and uses language that's pretty direct and uh, candid. And the, the letters, the Pew Johnson letters, are contained in the uh, Penn State University archives. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. An early insight into two very entrepreneurial and aggressive scientists who want to do great things for American agriculture. After Leipzig, Pew moves to the University of Göttingen, where he studies with Friedrich Wohler. And he earns a PhD. This is unusual. And you can see it here. There was a tradition at the time in Germany for the handful of American students were there, who were there who, when presenting their credentials for the PhD, were excused. If they said, I have to be out of town, they were excused from having to take oral examinations. All they had to do was produce a dissertation. Pew said, this will not stand. I'm going to sit for my orals in chemistry and physics in German. And of course, he passed summa cum laude. And after that, the tradition was American students are not going to be excused. They got to take their orals. Summer of 1856, Pew has his PhD in hand, and now he wanders over to Heidelberg, the oldest German university in existence, 1387. He wants to study with Robert Bunsen, and you know Robert Bunsen. He's the inventor of the, this is a smart crowd, very good. And some of you have actually taken chemistry, I can see that. Uh, Pew can't get into his lab. It's so, he's so popular. He's such a popular teacher that Pew uh, decides to make friends with some German professors in botany and trek out through the German countryside to collect plant specimens. While there, uh, Pew happens upon an estate sale uh, of uh, Professor Bischoff, and he buys the entire collection of plants, 3,000 specimens which exists to this day and can be seen in the Pennsylvania Agricultural Herbarium, which is in the basement of Whitmore Lab. And the specimens are still in awfully good shape. It's amazing. So Pew now moves over to Paris. And he becomes caught up in a raging scientific controversy. How do plants assimilate nitrogen? It's a big question. It's a big question because in America, the greatest agricultural problem of the mid-19th century is soil exhaustion. So how do you create nutrients that are going to bring agricultural yields back to where they should be? And so this was a very important question. How do you feed plants? And the, the basic question was, well, do plants assimilate nitrogen from the air or from the soil? What do you think the answer was? From the soil, you got it. But it took Pew a while to figure this out. So to do so, he leaves France and he goes to England, where at the famous Rothamsted Experiment Station, founded by these two gentlemen, um, he embarks on a very elaborate and very public, very transparent scientific experiment. And basically, after about 16 months at Rothamsted, Pew settles the question definitively. Plants assimilate nitrogen through the soil. This was a big deal because what this does is it lays the foundation for the modern ammonium nitrate fertilizer industry. And you can see what one of our late faculty members, Dr. Alfred Traverse, said about Pew's experiment. He said, if research of such significance were published today, the author would likely get a Nobel Prize. Pew's research got him elected 
as a fellow of the London Chemical Society, this is a big deal. You're in company with Michael Faraday and the leading chemists of Great Britain. And as I said, it also sets the, in concrete the basis of the modern fertilizer industry. Now we're gonna put Pew aside. He's in England. He's really the toast of the British Isles, if you will. He's a great young American scientist who has conducted a brilliant experiment. But we're gonna switch back to America. What's going on? Because at the same time, the agricultural college movement is beginning to get some wind under its sails. And it's gonna morph into the land grant college movement, which is a big deal for this country. Whoops, excuse me. But in order to set the stage, look at American higher education in the 1850s. There are about 220 colleges. Most, almost all of them, are private. They're denominational, meaning they have a religious, a denominational affiliation. They're typically, but not always, led by a minister. They tend to be geared toward literary studies and the classical languages. They're fairly small. The average enrollment is 75, 76, 77. Maybe they have a scientist on their faculty. Those faculties tend to be small, four to six people. But the scientists think of it. They're isolated one from the other. They're overburdened with the demands of teaching and student discipline. They really don't have the facilities or the time or energy or ability to keep up with what's going on in the scientific world. So not a whole lot is happening in terms of American science. But some of the, some of the uh, impulses behind the, what becomes the land-grant college movement in this country, uh, the democratic impulse. This starts way back with Thomas Jefferson and certainly with Andrew Jackson. And it's the impulse to make American society more responsive to the common man and later the common woman. And you've got to make a college education accessible to more people, especially the industrial classes. Who are the industrial classes? Basically anyone who works with their hands. And that's four out of five American adults. Those are the industrial classes. And most people who are working with their hands are on the farm. America is overwhelmingly agricultural. That's what most people did. And most farms, at least prior to 1850, are self-sufficing. You know, you're growing food to feed your family. Uh, about the turn of the century, they start to become a little more commercial. But almost, almost more than eight out of 10 Americans lived in the country. Also gathering ahead of steam is the utilitarian impulse, and that's the demand to make education more useful and practical and less classical. And of course, you make higher education more responsive to the emerging industrial economy. And you see here the old engineering building at Penn State, some of the students doing some work there, that beautiful building at the corner of College Avenue and the Allen Street Mall went up in flames in November of 1918. And of course, the fundamental force behind American higher education and the way it's changing is the rise of science. So the impulse is to make higher education more accommodating to science and technology, especially applied science, and especially in agriculture, and later in engineering. So in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania State Agricultural Society gets going about 1851. And this is an organization that is going to uh, pressure the, leg the uh, Pennsylvania General Assembly to do more things for the farmer. They elect this gentleman, Frederick Watts. And some of you may recall we have a Watts Hall in the West, residence, West Hall's residence area, named for this gentleman. Well, he is, if there is a, a single founding father of Penn State, it would be Frederick Watts. So he's elected president of the Pennsylvania State Agricultural Society, and he's gonna use that position with his colleagues to pressure the Pennsylvania General Assembly to establish an agricultural college. This is Watts's original business plan, if you will, for this institution. He's writing this to Governor William Bigler at the time. This is in 1853. He's saying, we need $38,000 to get this place up and running, including a $20,000 appropriation from the state. And the operating costs after that are gonna be about $16,000 per year. And those operating costs are gonna be highly dependent on student tuition, as you can see here. 
And they're thinking, well, we need 200 students. We need them to pay $75 a year. That'll create $15,000 in spendable income. So this plan is somewhat accepted, and the legislature in 1854, not in 1855, in 1854, charters the Farmers High School of Pennsylvania with 65 trustees. Well, you can imagine what the road system, you saw something of the road system today in Center <laughs> County. Imagine what it was like in 1854. You couldn't get anywhere, and so the trustees couldn't even muster a quorum. So the Agricultural Society went back to the legislature and the governor and said, we need to reduce the number of trustees and we need a new charter. And that happened with Governor uh, James Pollock. That's a name that should be familiar to you as well as Bigler. With 13 trustees, much more manageable. In 1859, Evan Pugh is hired. He accepts, he's still in England, but he accepts the presidency of the Farmers High School. The trustees have had their eye on him. And he says his goal, very clear, to develop upon the soil of Pennsylvania the best agricultural college in the world for the agriculture student of America. That's a pretty clear vision. His salary, $1,500 a year. And what you see here, that is the original Old Main. It was not called Old Main back then. There was no point in doing that because uh, there was only one building. So they called it the College Building. And this is really what Pew saw when he was taken from the train station in Spruce Creek by buggy with Hugh McAllister, driving him the 22 miles along bumpy roads through Pine Grove Mills and up into the, uh, the campus. This is the way it looked. So a tough place to, uh, to begin. There was a faculty of five, and Pew is gonna do just about everything. He'll have his fingers in everything, and including refining the curriculum to make sure that it is a state of the science, which he did. He forms a close working relationship with trustee Hugh McAllister, the people really driving this institution in its early years were Evan Pugh at the pinnacle, but the two trustees, Frederick Watts, who's president of our board of trustees now in 1855, and Hugh McAllister of Belfont. And Hugh McAllister's farm is, uh, well, it's out by the Belfont area high school. And I think Senator Bob Casey has his office, his center county office in the stone mansion that was the, uh, the farmstead for Hugh McAllister. But Hugh McAllister does a lot. He's local, he can get here pretty quickly if need be. And as the original Penn State historian said, there was scarcely a day which did not have some task for the college which demanded his thought and counsel. So one of our founders, strong and great, Hugh McAllister. Pew's first order of business set the standards for student behavior. Now we're into early 1860. I gotta tell you about the academic year. The academic year, begins in mid-February, and it goes 10 months straight through to mid-December. So it's 10 months, it follows the agricultural cycle, the agricultural calendar. So early February 1860, there's a drinking incident in that den of iniquity, Bowlesburg. <laughs> a couple of students make their way down there. They come back to campus inebriated. Pew hits the roof. He says either this tavern owner leaves town and sells his establishment or I'm taking him to court. The tavern owner buckled. So those kind of incidents go back a long, long, <laughs> long time. And uh, despite what Pew did, the uh, student drinking problem did not end then. But Pew also liked to appeal to the student's better angels, if you will. And he's saying, look, guys, we owe it to the friends of this institution and to the people of the great Keystone State not to let this great experiment fail. So he wants them to be as serious about making the agricultural college, still the Farmers High School at this point, successful. The whole world is watching. This just gives you a sense of some of the courses in what would be a lockstep curriculum at this point. 
And this is just the second and fourth year, just to give you a sample of some of the courses they would take. It was rigorous, very rigorous. In October of 1860, Pugh puts together a grand plan for American agriculture. And he delivers it to the Cumberland County. This is where Frederick Watts is from, the Agricultural Society. And basically, uh, he talks about the fact that the US is lagging far behind Europe in terms of scientific agriculture. And he argues for a national system of agricultural science and education provided by American agricultural colleges. And this institution was to serve as the model. That's why he was so intent on building it and making it successful. And his talk is printed and circulated around the country. So year one, 1860, he's uh, established the standards for student behavior. He's reorganized the curriculum. He's put out this grand plan for American agriculture. And most important, he has now, within the first year, won the confidence of the trustees. Frederick Watts says he is young, energetic, and writes as if he had devoted himself to the object of building the institution up into fame. Now, Pew's not making this stuff up as he goes. He has some principles for building a successful agricultural college. And the first one is, these places have to be of the highest academic quality. They can't be second rate. They can't be third rate. And I love this quote. They must stand in the same relation to agriculture that our highest military academies, West Point, Annapolis, stand to the art and science of war. These need to be first-rate institutions. They need to be research institutions. Keep in mind that the agricultural sciences were aborning. They were very young. They had not matured into the science that they would maybe 20 or 30 years later. So he wanted the faculty to basically invent the discipline of agricultural science based on their empirical work. He also said, these places have to be big. If you recall, the average size of a college, an American college at this time, was maybe 75, 76 students. And Pew is saying, we need 400 to 800 students here. These are huge numbers according to the standards of the day. And he said, a school like this, a scientific school, can't succeed as a small institution. Not going to work. These schools also have to be independent. They can't be attached to a literary college. In other words, they can't be attached to, let's say, Allegheny College in Meadville, or Gettysburg College, or Juniata College. They need to be freestanding, because the literary college will sap its vitality, rob it of its enthusiasm, take away its best students, and finally appropriate its means of subsistence. He's also saying that, hey, hello, you need to have a scientist heading these scientific institutions. And that was not always the case, as you shall see. So those are his principles. 1861, now the college building, remember when he got there, it was a third of the way complete. You got to get things moving. So he is pushing for a state appropriation so that they can afford to hire a new contractor and get this building done. This is the photo that he took to the Pennsylvania legislature in the spring of 1861 saying, hello, we need to get this place completed so that we can realize the vision and do the things we need to do for Pennsylvania agriculture. He's successful. He gets a state appropriation of almost $50,000 and construction can resume. 1861, also the first class of graduates, the first graduates in the United States to win the degree of Bachelor of Scientific Agriculture. 55 started in this class, 11 succeeded in earning degrees. This was a tough, rigorous curriculum. Uh, the graduates are rank ordered in terms of their academic performance, and they're also required to complete an undergraduate thesis. So Pew was ahead of the curve again. We were doing undergraduate research before that became cool in the 1990s. And you can see here some of the topics that these students uh, produced in terms of their uh, student dissertations. Okay, so 1861, things are rolling. The college building is now under reconstruction. It's going to be completed eventually. The first graduates and a new diversified curriculum is now produced, uh, removing some of the mathematical rigor for those who are just interested in 
uh, more of the uh, agricultural sciences related to horticulture and botany and biology. And he also introduced graduate study, the master's degree in scientific agriculture. This is 1861. All of this stuff is unheard of. Agricultural colleges, you know, are something of an oxymoron. College for farmers? What is going on here? All of this is new, experimental. We talked about uh, Pew and his experiment at Rodhamstead, his standing as a scientist. He's highly respected. You can see here some of his, uh, his work. But in 1861, he was asked by the US Bureau of Agriculture to do a report on American agricultural colleges. There were a few other experiments trying to get up and running, uh, not meeting with success. But he did that. And he was also invited to advise the Bureau of Agriculture, which was then a subunit of the US Patent Office on how it could transition to a US Department of Agriculture, which it did in the spring of 1862 when uh, Abraham Lincoln signed the legislation establishing what is now the USDA. And he was, of course, elected to the American Philosophical Society. This is a high honor for an American scientist. This was the society founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. So Pew has high standing, high credibility as a scientific leader, as a scientific administrator. And he was twice, twice offered the job of being chief chemist of the United States, of the US Department of Agriculture. And this, to me, these two paragraphs encapsulate the essence of Evan Pugh and his dedication to building up this institution into the finest institution, not just in the country, but in the world as agricultural colleges go. He said, I refuse to accept the head of that department when it was offered to me two years ago because I wanted to devote myself to agricultural education. The best way to do this, I conceive, is to make our own college a model which other American colleges, agricultural colleges will adopt. To do this, I am resolved to stay with the college. While God gives me strength to perform my duties there, whatever may be the pecuniary inducements or prospects of honor elsewhere, it is my duty and my destiny to do so. And I shall seek honors in the path of duty and destiny rather than at Washington. That is an amazing statement, and that gives you a sense of his dedication. Again, he's proposing grand plans to solve the problems of American agriculture. Uh, productivity. You start with a, a model college at the apex. You encourage other additional colleges to get up and running. Uh, you want agricultural experiment stations, research sta stations across the country to spearhead the research agenda. You want a fe strong federal department and you want a system for collecting and reporting statistics on American agricultural productivity. Now there are a few other colleges trying to get up and running. None of them very successful. And most of them, uh, their opening was precluded by the American Civil War. Men and money go to war. They don't go to higher education. I've always been interested in this controversy about which was first. Now you have Michigan. And they were the first to open in 1857. It is true. I grant them that. Um, they were chartered about 10 out of us in 1855. But their founding president was a newspaper editor who really didn't know much about agricultural science. And most of the students, in fact, almost all of them, going to the Michigan Agricultural College, opted for the classical curriculum, which makes no sense to me. But as you can see, one of their contemporaneous faculty members said, there's probably not one young man here for the sole purpose of studying the science of agriculture. Hello? Well. Not the case at the Farmers High School, despite the name. We had a true scientific curriculum, uh, and our 11 Bachelor of Scientific Agricultural graduates were the beneficiaries of a very sound agricultural education. And if you compare enrollments during the Civil War, during the Civil War, I mean, that's a challenge. How do you build a college to begin with in the 19th century? Very tough to do, agricultural or otherwise. How do you do it when there's a war on? Look what Pew did. Enrollments increase during the war. And our enrollments were twice of the Michigan Agricultural College, which we now know as Michigan State University. Well, 
In any event, even the American Civil War, there are three functioning state-sponsored agricultural colleges in this country, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, and in Maryland, although Maryland's was not doing much. They were following mainly an aristocratic model. The bottom line is the Farmers High School was dedicated to scientific agriculture, and far and away we were the most successful in realizing that standard. 1862, things are really moving along now. Enrollment grows. The name is changed to the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania. The Morrill Land Grant College Act is passed. This is a big deal. Pew issues a catalog. This is sort of our coming out party as a strong scientific agricultural institution. And in December, 15 more students graduate with a Bachelor of Scientific Agriculture. That's the largest graduating class until 1890. The Morrill Act. We won't go into great deal here, but the idea was the US Congress awarded to each state, based on its population, an amount of federal land. The idea was you sell this federal land, and you take the money, and you create an endowment, and you use the interest on that endowment to fund the educational enterprise. And you can see here the language of the Morrill Act is to, they wanted every state to have at least one college without excluding other scientific and classical studies. So we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, if you will, um, and including military tactics. That's wise. We're in a civil war. We need officers, OK? And to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts, yada, 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 in order to uh, promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes and the several pursuits and professions of life. So Pew is with his friends, with Frederick Watts and Hugh McAllister and the entire agricultural community in Pennsylvania pushing for this. We also had a congressman here in Center County, this guy, James Tracy Hale, who was on our board of trustees at the time and who was a very good friend of uh, Mr. Morrill. And he did a lot behind the scenes to make sure that the act was going to go through, which it did. And Pew uh, was praised for his leadership in the campaign to get the Morrill Act passed by the seminal land-grant college historian, a guy named Earl Ross, back in 1942, who said, Evan Pugh led the Pennsylvania group with characteristic zeal and with effective, if not determining, influence on the final result. Pugh is the only scientist in America who's lobbying, who's advocating for the passage of the Morrill Act. Now, if you go to Old Maine, in front of game day today, if you can get close, look up at the portico and you'll see some of the language etched into the limestone. It says basically, after the uh, act being signed by uh, Abraham Lincoln, it says, and the faith of the state, Pennsylvania, is hereby pledged to carry the same into effect. That was the legislation that went through in April of 1863, signed by our great Civil War Governor Andrew Curtin, to accept the terms of the Morrill Act. 1862, progress continues on the college building. They wanted to get it done by November of 1862. That's not going to happen. It's going to take another year. Also, work begins on the president's house. You see it here as it was completed in the early 1870s. Uh, the floor plan you see there is Pew's. He designed it. He helped to build part of it, but it was never completed during his lifetime. It was completed in uh, the fall of 1864, a few months after he had died. Pew was also saying, hey, I'll chip in a third of the cost if the trustees will provide the other two thirds. And he produces a masterpiece. This is the college catalog, and it's basically designed to trace the history of agricultural education starting in Europe centuries ago. And the genius of this is that he portrays the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania as the apex of this long, broad movement to improve scientific agriculture. Uh, this is the American exemplar right here at Penn State. This is interesting. This is the mission, if you will, of the university back then, the Agricultural College. And it's pretty much our mission today. It's an educational institution offering the range of natural sciences. Agriculture is the priority. It's practically oriented. 
that Penn State is a powerhouse of the applied sciences, as you all know. It's experimental. Research has to take place here. This has to be a research institution. We have to invent the discipline. And you know Penn State just completed the last year reaching $927 million in funded research. We are a great teaming encampment of the human mind, and it started under Evan Pugh. And a servant of the state. The mission is to protect the industrial interests of the state, and most especially the agricultural interest. Okay, so we're moving now into early 1863. The Civil War is still raging. This is high tide. We produce our first Master of Scientific Agriculture graduate. Enrollment increases. As Pew said, this is a, we have 142 students during the Civil War, a larger number that have been during the same time in attendance upon any other agricultural con uh, college in this country or in Europe. We had 11 resident graduates in attendance. These are graduate students. This is amazing work. And in April, as we said earlier, the Pennsylvania legislature basically accepts the terms of the Morrill Act. But then things begin to unravel, 1863, and we'll talk about each of these. In June, Pugh and his fiancée, Rebecca Valentine of Belfont, a beautiful woman, very intelligent, versed in all the or ornamentals that any well-refined Victorian woman would be versed in. Literature, music, poetry, needlepoint, and the uh, sewing arts. So they're in a buggy, they're visiting a cousin of Pew, who's in this house, which exists, you can go see it today, on the uh, banks of the Logan Branch in Belfont, Forge House. So they're leaving at night, it's a dark night, and somehow the buggy is thrown into Spring, Logan Branch of Spring Creek, which, which is right in front of this, this house. Rebecca's pinned under the buggy, in the water, Pew's arm is broken in the accident, yet he manages to pull the buggy off and extricate her and pull her out of the water. She's gonna be unconscious for days. They think she's gonna die, but she doesn't. But uh, Pew's arm is badly damaged, and I don't know how he endured the pain that he did in the weeks following the accident. He eventually goes to Philadelphia in mid-July after the Battle of Gettysburg, and he's gone for about 10 weeks as he's recuperating. Oh yeah, the Battle of Gettysburg. You've heard of this, right? Wow. So this is also a disruptive force on the college. Uh, Lincoln calls for 100,000 volunteers, 50,000 of them from Pennsylvania. And the college nearly empties out. It does not close down, but most students go off to serve in various ways. Pew doesn't like this. He doesn't think they're gonna be of uh, equal force to the grizzled veterans of the uh, Army of Northern Virginia. But they empty out uh, after the battle, which goes the right way, as you well know. Uh, most of the students are back on campus in early August, but Pew isn't. Let me just take a moment here to give you a sense of Pew's hatred of the Confederacy for its dissolution of the Union and its defense of slavery. Again, Quaker principles coming to the fore. But listen to this. I've made up my mind to give the rebel leaders two years to repent before being hung. I thank God that we now have a chance of killing men who I have long been satisfied would never be brought to reason in any other way. And Pew said earlier, had I not been here as president of the Agricultural College, I would have been off. I would leave my Quakerism at home till we could give those traitor scoundrels such a thundering thrashing as no, ever, as no people ever got before. He hated the South. He hated them. Dissatisfaction mounts. Pew is recuperating in Oxford. He is seeing a very reputable physician at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. He hires a friend of his, George Caldwell, from Oberlin College to come in and teach his chemistry classes. And there's also a certain Dr. Thompson who's stirring around with the trustees saying, hey, we've got to get Pew out of the presidency. That goes nowhere. Pew, as we said earlier, has the confidence of the trustees, so the crisis is averted. By late December, the building is almost done, not perfectly, 
Uh, Pew was a little bit dismayed because the students are now leaving for their winter break, and he wanted them to leave with a good feeling that the building is finally done. Professor Caldwell leaves. He's drafted into service. The vice president of the college, David Wilson, resigns. And now there are stirrings in the Pennsylvania legislature uh, to rescind the college's land grant status and to split it among other colleges. 1864, this is Pew's visionary master plan for organizing land grant colleges. It's the first report of its kind, and you can see the original historian of the land grant college movement says it's the most thorough and understanding early analysis. And Pew is arguing, he's saying, hey, US colleges Harvard, Yale, I don't care. They're too small, they're underfunded, faculty aren't paid nearly what they deserve to be paid. They're just vastly underfunded. We really have to get American colleges moving and scaled correctly. And he makes the case for this grander scale, and his model, of course, is the German university. And this rankles some people in the Pennsylvania legislature. What's this guy trying to do up there in Center County? Build a German university? Well, sort of. Pennsylvania, the land grant uh, bounty. Pennsylvania was entitled to 780,000 acres of land to be sold, use the proceeds to establish an endowment. That acceptance act we talked about in 1863 had an ominous clause in it. Yeah, we're gonna designate the agricultural college as the land grant institution until otherwise ordered by the legislature. And now the legislature is thinking, well, this is money. What can we do with it? We had to do something else, fund the common schools, help uh, the children of Civil War veterans, although none of those uses would have been allowed by the act. February of 1864, Pew and Rebecca find time to get married, which they do in Belfont in Willow Bank, which is the home of uh, Rebecca. Her father, uh, Abram Valentine, was an iron master, the Valentine and Thomas Iron works, iron forges, were one of the most prominent iron forges in this part of Pennsylvania. They find time to get married, and they uh, take a honeymoon. They want to visit Samuel Johnson and his wife in New Haven, Connecticut. They don't make it that far because Pew is called back to testify before the legislature. And Pew is saying, you know, the state needs to support a single industrial college, single agricultural slash engineering college. And these two cultures, agriculture and engineering, don't clash with one another, they're complementary. <coughs> and he makes the case for the agricultural college and he's saying, you know, we could use $47,000 uh, in our budget to hire 16 professors, that's a lot of people. And he's saying, well on second thought, you know, $87,000 would be even better. So uh, he's saying industrial colleges have to go beyond teaching. They have to do research. And he's talking about these wonderful German universities. Uh, Leipzig and Göttingen each had 110 professors. Well, that's not going over real well with some people in the legislature. But he's saying the agricultural college is the only public state-supported school in Pennsylvania. You had people in the legislature who were saying, well, it's a center county institution. And they're pushing back and they're saying, no, it is a state institution. It's the only college belonging to the whole people of the state and controlled by them, as its property is held in trust by a board of trustees elected by delegates from all county agricultural societies, 67 of them eventually in Pennsylvania. And he's saying, look, you're either gonna to give to the people of Pennsylvania one grand institution like Harvard or the world-renowned educational institutions of Europe, or you're gonna give them a bunch of small, bickering institutions that'll be up here every year arguing for money. March. Now, the trustees and Pew want to invite legislators and state officials to campus. The building is finished, and so they put on the dog. Big banquet, everything's running smoothly, and Dr. Pew tells Teleco Johnson, one of his students, that uh, I'm afraid this dinner is gonna cost more than we'll ever get out of it. He's right. Pew's efforts appear to be in vain. In April, the bills start to roll out of the state senate to basically take away the land grant designation from the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania. The first bill 
says we're going to take the designation and we're going to split it among six institutions. Allegheny College in Meadville, the University at Lewisburg, which you now know as Bucknell, Pennsylvania College, Gettysburg, the Western University of Pennsylvania, Pitt, the Polytechnic College of the State of Pennsylvania, it's no longer in existence, it died in the 1890s, and of course us. Pew is livid, he hits the roof. And you can see, he says, the effect of the bill is virtually to squander the entire proceeds for all time, to come of the magnificent grant of public land from Congress to the state for the purpose of industrial education. What you see here is the last word Pew will ever write. The word is state. Because he collapses at his desk after writing it. He manages to rally, present what would become his last lecture to his chemistry class in this room in the college building, which is now on the site of 105 Old Main. The next day, he's getting worse. He's taken to Willow Bank to be with Rebecca. Now keep in mind, they're married, but this may be the first commuting marriage in American higher education because there's no fit place for Rebecca to live. That's why Pew wanted to get the house done. He's not gonna bring her into Old Main. That's no fit place for a woman. Well, as Pew is being loaded into the wagon, he says, I am tired. My brain is tired, but I have a body that will stand everything. Meanwhile, Pew is in Willowbank, but the battle in the legislature is raging. However, long story short, we're saved by the bell because time runs out in the legislative session, and basically you can't pass legislation as the session ends. Uh, it's just not possible. It's not allowed by uh, legislative protocol. So they vote to basically postpone the bill, and you can see the vote 47 to 44 to postpone. So that gives you a sense of our friends and enemies, how they split proportionally. April 29th, a week later, Pew dies at Willowbank. And his death, it's attributed to a number of factors. A weakened immune system from his broken arm that eventually heals, but it's never working perfectly. Overwork and stress, and it's typhoid fever that takes him out. Typhoid fever, one of the banes of the 19th century. He did not live to see the final vote in the legislature which postponed the bill that would have taken the land grant designation away. I wonder what it was like in his final moments of lucidity, thinking, I'm very sick, things are going, my, my entire dream is being stolen from me. He never lived to see it. His death shocks the nation's scientific and agricultural communities. His death is a loss to Pennsylvania and the nation, says the American Journal of Science and Arts. The Pew aftermath, very quickly, the land grant status of this institution is hotly contested for the next three years. Finally, in February 67, there's a bill that awards the entire land grant, finally, to the Agricultural College. Pew is vindicated, though he's been dead almost three years. And for the next 18 years, the college enters a strange era, an era of drift under the next five presidents. And basically, long story short, we abdicate our land-grant mission, we devolve into a backwoods classical college, and we're almost closed for good. We came this close to getting the death penalty, the real death penalty. Fortunately, we're rescued by our second founder, George Atherton, who comes here from Rutgers. He's here for 24 years. He's not a scientist, but he knows what to do. He's a leading national land-grant college advocate. And he reconciles Penn State back to its land-grant mission, and he especially builds up the engineering disciplines. By the end of his tenure, we're one of the top 10 producers of engineering graduates in this country. And he sets us on course for a successful 20th century. So, coming to the end, Pew's major accomplishments, you see them here. A great scientist, a great researcher, he built the first successful agricultural college in America on the highest scientific standards. He did this in the midst of the American Civil War. He secured our land grant status. He defended that land grant status. He advocated for a national system and he put together a visionary plan that basically was a blueprint for other institutions to follow. So his legacy, in Latin, it's Christopher Wren's legacy. Christopher Wren, of course, rebuilt London after the Great Fire of 1666, but this legacy applies to Evan Pugh. See, monumentum requiris circumspica. If you seek his monument, look around you. 
Penn State, our alma mater, this incredible institution, now a top 100 global university. There are more than 27,000 colleges and universities on planet Earth. And you can see the Center for World University Rankings put us 43rd worldwide for the 2018-19 academic year. You know, we're in a company with Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, Harvard, Stanford, Michigan, yes, Michigan, Wisconsin, Berkeley. We are a superb, great teeming encampment of the human mind. And Pew, had his brilliant life been spared, said Charles Brown, chief chemist for the USDA back in the 1930s, had his brilliant life been spared, we are confident that by the force of his leadership, the great movement which began in the 80s, the 1880s, for the promotion of agricultural chemistry and scientific agriculture would have been advanced by at least a decade. No question, had he lived, this would be a, a different institution. We'd have matured much more quickly than we did. And uh, science in America would have benefited had he lived. So that's the story. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have an appreciation for how we got our roots. Let's have another round of applause for Roger Williams. At this time, we'll say goodbye to our online audience. Thanks again for joining us. And be sure to check out our YouTube channel, which you can access directly by searching Penn State Alumni Association or from our website at alumni.psu.edu. So as a reminder, please fill out your evaluation forms located in the Take a few questions. Thanks very much, Paul. Happy to entertain any questions. Yes, uh, Art. Uh, Roger, uh, by the way, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, Roger, you know, I've been here for a uh, producing all of this. Uh, Thank you. I was just curious as to what you can add to how the process by which the school was located in this place. Uh, yes. Not exactly the most accommodative to growing ag agricultural season or yes. access or just about anything else. How it was located here, there's, that's a big long story. I'll cut it down very quickly. Uh, basically, the State Agricultural Society, the Pennsylvania State Agricultural Society, put out bids and invited proposals from all points in Pennsylvania for citing this school. It was not predetermined it would be here. And so proposals came in from Blair County, Huntington County, Erie County, Allegheny County, Union County, uh, and maybe a couple, and um, Franklin County, maybe a couple of others, and Center County. And this was very attractive. A committee of the trustees made site visits to each and General Irvin, James Irvin, who was the iron master of uh, Center Furnace right here, uh, early on put in a bid, and the Center County Cultural Society came forth and said, uh, this, this is a place to do it. So Center County was visited in June of 1854. And it was ultimately selected, and it incurred a lot of criticism because it's like, you know, this is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the only thing that was close to this land, we, we were given 200 acres by General Irving with a, uh, Irvin with a, uh, basically the, the offer of another 200 acres if we could raise the money locally uh, to produce a match on the part of the state to buy the extra 200 acres. So uh, this place was selected and the reasons that Frederick Watts gave were Five, soil, surface, exposure, centrality, and healthfulness. So based on those criteria, Center County was selected. It's good farmland, there's no question about it, but it's very remote. And because of that, we had to deal with criticism for the next 50 years, 100 years even. <laughs> Remember, uh, President Sparks said, uh, this university is equally inaccessible from all parts of the state. <laughs> And that was in the, uh, you know, the teens. So that's kind of the way we came about. 
Sir. Was that first building already here, or was it built for the college? It was built for the college. Uh, construction started in 1856. It proceeded apace. 1857, an economic crisis hit this country, the so-called Panic of 1857. So the money supply tightened up. The contractor went out of business, and uh, things stopped. They continued construction, and they got a third of the building done by the time they were to open in February of 1859. Yes, ma'am. Where was Evan Pugh buried? Where was Evan Pugh buried? He is buried in Union Cemetery in Belfont. And it's worth a, a visit. He's buried in the uh, Valentine family plot, which is kind of in the center of the cemetery. There's a wrought iron fence that surrounds it, so it's easy to find. So that's where he was put to rest. Rebecca is put to rest beside him. Rebecca never remarried. She was a widow. She was married for three months. She was a widow for 57 more years. She died in 1921. We have, we have time for one more question. Yes. What did the graduates, early graduates do? Uh, some of them returned to farming. Some of them went into, uh, Alfred Smith, whom you saw here, he went into pharmacy as a pharmaceutical chemist. Uh, all of them came back for their 50th anniversary uh, reunion. Uh, but they went on to business. Some of them were going back to the farm. But uh, they were all pretty successful. Dean Hood? Given the relation, uh, the similarity intellectually between Abraham Lincoln and Evan Pugh, is there any evidence of a relationship between those two individuals? Between Pugh and Lincoln? Yeah. I, I found no indication that they ever met. But Pugh was, uh, he did speak with a, a congressman from Illinois who was very close to Lincoln in terms of uh, you know, how, you, how you want to restructure the uh, U.S. Bureau of Agriculture into a full-fledged federal department. But I saw no indication that he ever met Abraham Lincoln. But Lincoln was very, very favorably disposed to agricultural colleges, as you know. Maybe one more? Maybe one more? Sir. Uh, the first class, it started with fi the senior class with 55. Most of them came with advanced standards. They had studied somewhere. Uh, and they were interviewed by Pew. I mean, he would make a determination about whether they should continue in this class or be put in an earlier class or, or whatever. Uh, most of them had some education. The admission requirement, though, was for you had to be 16 years of age. So a lot of these guys were boys, you know, teenage boys who were coming here. They were pretty young. Uh, but, but most all in that first class did have some, some sort of education at another academy or college or whatever. Yeah. Have another round of applause for Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.